Good morning to you all. It's uh, good to welcome you to our morning service today. Our preacher today is Seth Rigglesworth, our good friend from Hollywell Church. Seth has been with us on a number of occasions before and we look forward to his ministry. I don't think I've got any announcements to make for today, so I'll hand over to Seth so that he can lead us in worship. Thank you. Hello to all of you at East Leak Church and any others who might be listening in online. Thank you for having me to speak for you this week and to lead you in worship. I'm going to start our time by a couple of words from 1 Timothy. This is the Apostle Paul writing and I guess these words will be familiar to many. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life now to the king eternal immortal invisible the only God be honor and glory forever and ever amen those words of Paul where he recognises his own sinfulness and his unworthiness of the gospel to which Christ has called him, I'm sure are words that many of us have used in our own prayers and private devotions. We recognise our sin, but as we recognise our sin in the light of the gospel, it only leads us to praise. It leads us to wonder. It leads us to rejoice and be thankful for what God has done for us. Well, I've chosen our first hymn on that same basis. We're going to sing, And can it be that I should gain? How is it possible that I should be forgiven, welcomed into the family of God? Let's sing, And can it be, together. Hey. 
Well, we're going to continue our service this morning with a reading from God's Word. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 2. I'll just give you a moment to find that. Colossians chapter 2. Paul writes this. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged, encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom I hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, And in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. His lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you still submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Quite a long reading for today. Uh, We're not going to be looking at all of the chapter. Actually, I'm just going to be focusing on two verses, verse 6 and 7. But it's helpful to read the whole chapter. And there's some uh, very deep truths in there, some timely reminders to us about how we ought to be living uh, for Christ in this world. So I hope that's been a benefit to you to read the whole chapter. And we will consider more closely just a couple of those verses later on. I'm going to lead us in prayer now. Um, I'm going to be praying for um, ongoing gospel outreach. Uh, I know you over at East Leek are continuing to seek to be witnesses for Christ wherever you are, in your homes, neighbourhoods, families, uh, perhaps if you're going out to work. 
Um, and similar here at Hollywell, we're seeking to continue spreading the gospel, sharing it with our family and friends and neighbours. And although a lot of what we do as a church and a lot of our outreach uh, has been impeded by the lockdown, we're not able to see people physically, uh, we're still able to do a little bit. And uh, so by the time you're watching this, for example, uh, this week we will have had a uh, an evangelistic outreach run online. So we've had a chap called Jeremy Marshall um, come and give his testimony uh, about how his faith in Christ has helped him uh, as he faced a terminal diagnosis or an incurable diagnosis of cancer. Um, so I don't yet know how that's gone because uh, I'm recording this on Tuesday, the event is on Thursday and you're watching this on Sunday. Um, but there will, have, there will have been people watching that, I'm uh, almost certain. Um, there's other ways that we're reaching out as well. Our Friday children's groups haven't stopped. Um, they did for a time, but they've now been picked back up. And there's content going out online for children and their families. And so we're glad that a number of children are still getting involved week by week. A number of children from the church are being built up and strengthened in their faith. And still a number of children from outside the church are logging in and listening to uh, the gospel teaching. And so we pray for that work and for the relationships that can hopefully be maintained through that. We're obviously finding the whole thing a bit of a frustration, uh, as I'm sure you are, not being able to, to meet together. It really is the heart of what the church is, uh, a gathering of believers. And so it's really uh, difficult to know just how to do church in this situation. And so um, we can also be praying for wisdom um, as the lockdown starts to lift. When is the right time to be meeting together? Um, what do we do about those who can't yet meet with us when perhaps other people can? Um, how do we do that as a church in a wise and caring and loving way and in a way that continues to meet the regulations that the government imposes? A number of things there. I'm sure there's some parallels to your own situation over in East Leek. Let's pray together. Lord our God, um, sometimes when we face the difficulties and the frustrations and the hurt of life, we wonder why it is that you can't just um, draw us away to be with Christ and why we can't have our inheritance sooner and why we can't be invited into your presence why is it that we have to endure the difficulties and the hurt of this world and all the frustrations that come with it and yet your word teaches us that the very simple reason is that because the church has a work to do a task of spreading your glory and your gospel throughout this whole world and as we face those difficulties and uncertainties then our our conduct through those times is the witness that speaks to the world about who Christ is and about how what he's like and and how he changes people and it's an opportunity to speak hope into situations in a way that really has power and influence and so we pray for our own response as we live through the frustrations of the lockdown, the pandemic, and all the other fresh frustrations that have been uh, rising up in the past week or so. Father, we pray for the ongoing witness of the church. We pray that the church's witness would be widespread, that people all over the UK, all over the, the world would see that although the Almost every country in the world is, is shutting down and closing down what's been happening. Yet the church continues to meet as best it can. We continue to pray to you. We continue to worship you. We continue to sing your praise. We continue to hope. We continue to believe that Jesus is our saviour, that he died and that he is risen from the dead. And Father, we, we're not quite certain how it might be that the world would see these things when so much of it is, um, we don't have that physical presence anymore. And yet, because of the wonders of modern technology, the internet, uh, communications, many more people are unable to, to watch what we're doing, to see how we live and how we act and, and how we speak. And so, Father, we pray that you would use this opportunity 
to make the gospel go out to far more people than it ever was doing previously. We pray for ourselves as individuals as well as for the church generally. We pray uh, that you'd help us to be diligent in uh, thinking and, uh, and taking opportunities uh, to share the gospel with those around us. For some, those opportunities might not come all that frequently, as the number of people that we meet is quite low. Yet we will have opportunities, and there will be chances to demonstrate our faith to those around us. And so we pray it help us to be bold, and to be decisive and purposeful in the way that we do that. We pray, of course, for your spirit to work in the hearts and the minds of those men and women, boys and girls, who continue to, to hear the gospel in whatever way. And with that in mind, I would pray for the young people's groups here at Hollywell. Um, they're happening every Friday afternoon online. Father, I pray that you would use the gospel teaching to make it clear to those young people that there is uh, a need of a saviour that they have and that there is a saviour who's good enough to be their saviour. Father, we pray for the gospel presentation, that it would be clear, that it would be engaging, and we pray for the relationships between the leaders and the young people, which are so important in leading people to Christ. And we pray that although the, the groups are happening on, online, <clears throat> that the leaders would still be able to form good, close relationships with the people that they're meeting with. We pray for those who have heard Jeremy Marshall's uh, testimony this last Thursday. And Father, we ask uh, that you would take that message that was given, uh, the testimony, the, the, the witness of Jeremy to the, to the hope that you've given him and the promises he has in the gospel. And even now, be stirring people's hearts and minds to recognise and remember the truth that Jeremy shared with us. Father, we pray that you'd be using these things and others to, to draw people to Christ. We pray that you'd be using this service even, uh, that, we, uh, that we celebrate together this morning. Father, we ask that you would use this to be a witness for Christ and to speak to any unbelievers who might be listening in. Father, I would pray as well for the unity of our churches, for East Leek, for Holywell. It's such an important uh, virtue of the church to be united. Jesus himself said it was the, the way that the world would know that we are his disciples. And so I pray that despite the, the distance that we have to keep from one another, we would still be able to find ways to show love and compassion to each other and to share fellowship with one another. I pray for East Leek especially as they look to the future, um, as they think about what might be next for their church and perhaps as they consider uh, appointing a new pastor. Father, I pray that you would give great wisdom to those who are leading that process and taking a, a, a leading role. And I pray for the believers in it at, at East Leek that you, would, that you would grant a great sense of unity. That whatever decisions are made, that they would make them together. And that they would be made for the good of the congregation, the body. Recognising each of the different members of the body. Each of their different needs and requirements. And that people would be willing to serve, to put others first. To make those decisions in humility. I pray against disunity, which so dishonours Christ and which so damages his church. Father, would you protect us from disunity, which does so much damage. And Father, we pray for an end to this lockdown. We pray that we would be able to meet together soon. We thank you that we have got the freedom now. Uh, the government has allowed us to uh, perhaps meet in each other's gardens, meet small groups at a time. Um, Father, we pray as those restrictions continue to be lifted, that churches around the country will be careful about how we, how we begin meeting together again. There are all sorts of risks involved. Uh, there are all sorts of opportunities involved. We want to take the opportunities. We want to enjoy meeting with one another again. We want to hear the, the sound of, of singing and praying together. But we don't want to do it in a way that harms, and we don't want to do it in a way that ostracizes or pushes certain people away we want to do it in a loving compassionate and considerate way and so we pray for great wisdom as we consider those things and patience for us as we wait for them to come 
Father, we pray that you'd be building us up in our faith. We pray that we would have used this time wisely, the extra time we've got on our hands. Uh, we pray that we would come out of this recognising that as a, a time of blessing, where we've been able to more carefully consider your word and more wholeheartedly devote ourselves to uh, living for you. We pray for our time this morning around your word as we study these verses from Colossians. We pray that these verses would build us up and strengthen us in our faith. We pray that we would be receptive to your word and that your spirit would speak to each one of us as you speak through me. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. The next song we're going to sing is Come Let Us Sing of a Wonderful Love. After this song, we will be considering those words from Colossians again. Come let us sing of a wonderful love. Well, as Christians, we are to be uniquely a thankful people. We are to be thankful people. And I'm sure most of you recognise the importance of being thankful. You will try and include thanks in your prayers as a, a regular feature. Um, often it's the way we start our prayers. We begin by thanking God for uh, the gifts he has given us. But although we recognise the importance of thankfulness, sometimes, don't you find... That thankfulness can be difficult to, to achieve. It's, it's emotionally draining, I mean. And here's, here's a couple of examples that, that demonstrate that. If you say grace before your meal, for example, how often do you just say the same words before each meal? Because to maintain a freshness, to maintain a, a, a real emotional attachment to those words that you're saying is draining emotionally. It's hard to be really truly uh, fully thankful each time we eat our meals. Some things we just begin to take for granted. And when we are reminded, um, perhaps by verses from the New Testament or perhaps by other Christians, of the need to be thankful, sometimes it can feel like a, a childish little exercise. Uh, thank you God for 
food and houses. Thank you, God, for our clothes and our families. And we are thankful for those things and we recognise them as gifts from God's hand. And yet it seems like surely there's something greater that we can be thankful for. Surely there's something more. And even when we include thanks in our prayers, regularly praying, for, for example, in the prayer meetings that you might be at, even when we include thanks as part of our prayers, the thanks is so often just a small portion of the prayer. So often it's used almost to get our lips moving, if you like. Thank you, Lord, for your word. But now here's my real prayer. Please teach me from your word. Do you get a sense of what I mean? Thankfulness does permeate a lot of what we do as Christians, but so often it's there as a kind of uh, tradition or a duty rather than always being heartfelt and attached to our emotions. Now I'm going to make a further comment on that later on. And my aim this morning is not to, to try and fill you with such a sense of emotion and wonder and gratitude that you, that you turn off the video just being full of thankfulness gushing out of your mouths. Even if I was able to achieve that, the effect would last, at, at the very best, a couple of hours. Rather, what I want to do is consider why it is that Christians are told to be thankful. Yes, told to be thankful. And why is it that Christians seem to be thankful when we read the New Testament and when we listen to the ways hymns are written and when we listen to the prayers of our brothers and sisters? Why are we thankful? And if we can consider the purpose of thankfulness then I hope that what that will do for us is help us to be more deliberate in our thankfulness. Now, the verse that I'm going to be focusing on is Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Paul says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Paul says, look, I want, you to, I want you to be doing these things. And he ends with overflowing with thankfulness. Thankfulness is commanded. But is there anything more specific here than just the, the general term thankfulness? Be thankful, which of course can have such a, a broad range of meanings. Thankful to whom? Thankful for what things? How often do I need to be thankful? And there's so much more behind that word thankfulness. Are there any more specifics that we can tease out of the passage? Well, that's what I want to do this morning with you. And two specifics in particular. One is we ought to be thankful for our salvation in Christ. And the second is we ought to be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So first, thankful for our salvation in Christ. Why have I said this is one of the specific ways that Paul means us to be thankful? Well, look back up at chapter 2, verse 2. Paul's saying, look, I am working hard for you guys. Why am I working hard? Verse 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is working so hard for the churches, so that the churches might know more about who Christ is, about God's mystery revealed to us in Christ. That is, Paul is working hard so that people might know the reconciliation that God has achieved, through Christ, drawing sinners to himself, fixing the frustrations and the bondage to decay that the world suffers. All of these things God is achieving through Christ. And Paul wants the churches to know that. And so he works hard for it. Verse 5, Paul goes on, look, though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. And I delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul says, my aim is that people might know more of Christ. 
I'm delighted, verse 5, that you do know something of Christ. Verse 6, so then, that is, in order that this may continue, in order that you might not lose that knowledge of Christ, in order that you might not forget the hope you have in Christ, in order that you might not turn away from the forgiveness you have received in Christ. So then, verse 6, continue to live in him, overflowing with thankfulness, verse 7. I, I really think Paul's sense here in this verse is, is he wants the, the Christians to be remembering what they have received in Christ. What it means for them to, to, to obtain something of the fullness of Christ. What it means for the eternal God to live in their hearts by his spirit, the spirit of Christ. And Paul doesn't want them to forget. And so he urges them to be thankful. Be thankful for these things in particular. My interpretation is, is backed up if you go back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 9. Paul says, look, I've been praying for you guys. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this so that, now we skip down to verse 12. Skip, we, we pray this so that you would be giving thanks to the Father. Paul's desire is that the, the, the Colossian Christians would be giving thanks to the Father. The Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints, the kingdom of light. God has done so much for us. Give him thanks. The more you see of it, the more you ought to thank him. The more you recognise his blessing and provision and forgiveness and the wonders of the gospel the more your heart ought to be overcome with praise and thankfulness for it. Now you might say, but, but hang on a moment. I can see what you're saying here. I can see that there's a link between the thankfulness and the salvation and the gospel, the, the gift of Christ himself. There's certainly a link there. But you might ask, is this thankfulness commanded or is it just the result of being saved? Are we actually being told to do anything here? Well, actually, I think perhaps both sides of that question are correct. There is a sense in which Paul feels, look, if you, if you recognise what God has done for you, how could you not be thankful? But also there's a sense in which he, he does want to be specific to the Christians and say, look, you ought to be thankful. Later on in the letter, he, he specifically makes thankfulness an imperative. We'll look later at chapter 3, verse 15. And be thankful, Paul says. He gives it as a command, something we ought to do, not just something we will naturally feel if we are Christians. You see, our emotions sometimes influence our words. I hope you felt that with thankfulness. I hope there have been times in your Christian life where you, where you have been overwhelmed, perhaps by your sin and the freedom that you have from sin, perhaps from what it might have cost Jesus to descend from heaven to become a man, perhaps of the, the benefits that you have of being part of a church, perhaps of a specific answer to prayer that God has given you. I hope there's been times when your emotions have been so overwhelmed that, that all you can do is be thankful to God. But there are also some times when our emotions don't necessarily line up with what we ought to be doing. Like at the meal times, for example, we don't always feel overwhelmed by thankfulness for the meal in front of us. And so Paul's saying, be thankful then. Be thankful. Make it your aim. Be deliberate in in putting habits into your daily routine so that you can remind yourself to be thankful for the things you have received. Yes, our emotions might sometimes influence our words and the way we pray, but the reverse is also true. If we make ourselves use words of thanks, if we make ourselves set up those routines of thankfulness, it will help 
shape our emotions and our reasoning and our mindset. How then does thankfulness lead to this more complete understanding that Paul's got in mind for the Christians? Remember that was his purpose of working, that they may have complete understanding, knowing the mystery of God, namely Christ. How does thankfulness help bring us a fuller understanding of who Jesus is and what we have in him? Well, a, a glance through the context of Colossians might, might give you one example of the way that happens. In, Colossia, in Colossae, the Christians were facing a heresy where false teachers were trying to drag them away from the gospel. Not, not in a very overt way, but in a very subtle way. Trying to add extra rules, extra regulations. You must be like this. You must have this done to you. You must obey these rules. You must not eat those foods. You must not touch those things. Adding on extra rules, which they were saying a person must obey if they were to be saved. Now, the problem with those sorts of schemes and teachings is that it means, well, it brings doubt into the situation. Have I done enough? Have I obeyed all the right rules? Am I really going to be saved? A thankfulness for our salvation, on the other hand, especially if we make it a constant, regular thing, is a help to remind us that no, it, salvation doesn't depend on me. Salvation doesn't depend on the, work, the works that I can do or on handling or not handling these foods or observing these days or, or whatever else it might have been. My salvation is bought. Christ has died. The work is finished. He is risen and the hope is mine. I am saved. And by thanking Jesus for the work that he has done, we are in effect preaching that gospel to us. To ourselves again and again. Thank you Jesus that the work is done. Not like for example the, the Pharisee in the temple. He went in and said thank you God that I am doing the works. Thank you that I am the good man. Thank you that I'm not like other people. Jesus of course condemned him. Paul encourages us to, to pray Yes, to, to, to pray the, the tax collector's prayer, God have mercy on me, but to go one step further. God, thank you that you have had mercy on me. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the work that you have done. Thank you that the responsibility is no longer on my head. Paul wants us, Paul wants us to be thankful for our salvation in Christ. And secondly, uh, and let me just stress, these are not the only reasons or purposes to be thankful. There are many more ways that we can be thankful. But I think these two are particularly important and I think they can be seen in the text here, which is why I'm focusing on these. So firstly, thankful for our salvation in Christ. Secondly, thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Back to verse 2. Why is Paul working so hard? So that they may be united in love. Part of Paul's purpose is that the church would be united. So then, verse 6, in order that these things might continue, be overflowing with thankfulness. Uh, again, we could, uh, now might be the right time to skip to chapter 3, verse 15, and see what, where Paul repeats this command. And this time the context is very specific and very obvious that Paul is talking about unity between believers. Chapter 3, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Now there you've got uh, Paul saying, look, there ought to be peace between you. There ought to be fellowship between you as you share the word of God with one another. And then in the middle there's this little instruction, be thankful. Now, you could say, well, the thankfulness is just uh, general thankfulness. But surely you see from that context, context, actually, the thankfulness is very specifically related to either that which comes before or that which comes after, or actually, I think, probably both. The thankfulness is a means to maintaining and preserving and developing the unity 
that Paul was striving for in the church. Now, thankfulness, actually, when you look at it in the New Testament, there are maybe three or four cases where Paul commands us to be thankful. But there are far more cases of where Paul's saying, I am thankful. In fact, in almost every letter that Paul has written, recorded for us in the New Testament, Paul says, I am giving thanks for you. The only one that I couldn't find Paul saying it in was in Galatians. There, I don't think Paul says, I'm thanking God for you. He just gets straight into his letter. But to the Romans, yes, even to the Corinthians, Think about the Corinthians and all the mess that was going on in their church. To uh, those at Philippi, to those at Colossae, to the the Ephesians, to uh, the Thessalonians, to Philemon, to Timothy, to Titus. Paul says, I am thankful for you. Now it's, it's interesting to think about why Paul would be thankful. Okay, the Philippians, he says, I'm thankful that you have joined with me. You're in partnership with me. We're doing this together. And so I'm thankful for you guys. But actually, even for the Philippians, he speaks in in other ways. And for the the other churches, surely you can't say that. And and even here in Colossae, Paul's saying, actually, there's some people that he's working for, some people even that he's praying for that he has never even met. Did you notice that in um, chapter 2, verse 1 of Colossians? Um, I am. I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. And you know, his prayers follow a similar kind of pattern. He prays for people in the church and includes in his prayers many people who he's never met personally. Now, if we consider thankfulness and being thankful for other people, just in, in a very limited kind of way, a, a way that I'm thankful for the blessing they have been to me then surely you can see how that kind of thankfulness does not align with Paul's kind of thankfulness. You know, I'm sure you've been thankful in your life for um, for your pastor, for example, for uh, a mentor who has taught you things and built you up in the faith. You've been thankful for your, your wife or, or your husband or your children who bring you such joy and, and are such a help to you. You've been thankful for godly people in the church who are such an example to you. You just look at the way they live and you listen to them speak and you're so encouraged and built up. But Paul is thankful for far more people than just those who have been a help to him. He's thankful for for all the people that he's meeting and working for. Why is he thankful for them? What benefit have they been to him? What sense of gratitude does he really have for them? If you look through what Paul says he's praying for, he says he's praying for things like, I'm thankful for your faith and your love. I'm thankful for your perseverance. I'm thankful that your faith is an example to all the believers. I'm thankful for the grace that has been given to you. I'm thankful that you are growing in sanctification. I'm thankful that you take the word of God seriously. Now, all these things are external to Paul. He's not receiving any benefit of them himself. And so how can he be responding with gratitude? Well, I think the answer is, actually, Paul does see himself as benefiting from these things that are happening in the lives of these believers. But not in the way you and me might consider benefit. I think what Paul, if you get the sense of Paul's theology, he feels so united to Christ So one with Christ. You remember he said, for me to live is Christ. That when he can see God doing the work in others who are also united to Christ, and they're also actually united to Paul himself in Christ, then it's as if that the, the benefit that God is doing the work of those believers, the benefit that God is giving to those people, is actually a benefit to Paul. God is building up other individuals in the church. Therefore, he's building up the body of Christ. Therefore, he's building up Paul himself. Such is the unity, I feel, that that Paul has uh, a sense of in the church. If I'm united to Christ and if you're united to Christ, then we are united together. And if that is true, then when God blesses you, he blesses me. 
And so Paul is thankful for the way other believers are growing in their faith, getting more knowledge of Christ. And so that then feeds his prayers for them. You will often find that Paul says, I'm thankful that God has given you this grace. I'm praying for more grace. I'm praying for spiritual strength. I'm praying for encouragement. And it's very rare, actually, that you find Paul praying, praying for physical needs, for the health of people, for, for their financial situation, for the political situation. More often, Paul is saying, God, would you build up your church, build up these people, glorify Christ through these people. He prays for their sanctification, for their love, for their growing knowledge of Christ. Now, if we are going to reflect that kind of thankfulness in our prayers, then, then what would that look like? Well, as we pray in thankfulness, it ought to be a reminder to us of the unity we share with that brother or sister. And so even those people in the church who are perhaps a frustration to us, perhaps we don't get on with all that well, perhaps we're not certain what benefit they have directly with us because we're quite far removed from them just in the, uh, the ordinary day-to-day -day running of the church yet we can still be thankful because we can see God's grace is at work in them and as we are thankful to God for them it's a reminder to us of our unity with them it's a reminder to us of our obligation to them of our brotherhood or sisterhood with them and this kind of thankfulness eliminates selfishness because your prayers become less about uh, who's being benefited. Uh, am I winning? Are they winning? Do they need building up or do I need building up? Whose priorities is going to come first, theirs or mine? It, it removes that dichotomy. It stops you putting yourself on a pedestal. It stops you... Uh, degrading yourself in a way that the gospel uh, doesn't teach us to uh, and, and elevating others which is sometimes a risk it eliminates all of that selfishness and it says we are united we are a body together and our prayers then are for this body father build us up father teach us lord jesus reveal yourself to us spirit move amongst us and cause us to be more powerful witnesses for Christ. I think Paul is urging us to be thankful for our brothers and sisters. Emotions drive our thankfulness sometimes. We've already said that this evening. But also, being deliberately thankful can help drive our emotions and it can help drive our reasoning and thinking. If we want to be rooted in Christ, if we want to share the priorities of Christ, to be strengthened in our, in our faith, then Paul's saying that here there are at least two important ways we ought to be praying. We ought to be praying in thankfulness for what Christ has done for us on our behalf. We ought to be thankful that the work of salvation is complete and none of it rests on our head. And we ought to be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are the body of Christ. They are his glory and witness here on earth. And they are even perhaps the most tangible connection that you have with Christ. When you meet with his body, the church. So we can be thankful for them. And the way that God reveals himself through those people. And therefore, if we, if we allow the, those types of thankfulness to become deliberate and regular in our prayers, then what we will find is that our thankfulness is less, far less impulsive. We, we don't have to wait for the emotions to simmer up inside of us before we're able to give thanks. But our thanks can be deliberate and thought through and rational. Yes, perhaps not connected to the emotions sometimes, but giving thanks merely because we recognise it as the right thing to do. 
but that in turn will also lead the emotions to well up in our heart, for that thankfulness to truly overflow. I hope that has been some useful meditations on the theme of thankfulness. I wonder if we can close by singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us. The reason I chose this song is because it points us back to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but also because it's perhaps one of the songs which most helpfully for me personally, and I know for many others as well, most helpfully leads us to that position of thankfulness. Engaging our emotions, engaging our thinking, and causing us to overflow with thankfulness to God. But remember, you don't have to wait to sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us or any other Christian hymn or song. You don't have to wait for a particularly moving, quiet time one morning to be thankful to God. We can be thankful deliberately and purposefully because we know because we are reminded of the things that are true, whether we feel them or not. So let's sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I hope it moves you to thankfulness, but if not, I hope you're also able to pray in thankfulness regardless. Let's sing together. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, Please be assured that we at Hollywell Church continue to pray for Eastleek, uh, especially as you consider your future together. I'd just like to close our service now by leading us in, in a prayer of thankfulness. I hope you can join me in this prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as your people, as your children, as forgiven sinners, we certainly do have so much to thank you for. And even this topic that we've considered this this morning has been is such a small representation of the many things that we can be thankful for. Help us not to forget that all that we have comes from your hand. Help us not to forget, more importantly, that our salvation is given to us in Christ. That he has completed that work on our behalf. We have all of his righteousness. 
He has borne all of our sin. He has welcomed even the filthiest of sinners. Lord God, we thank you for these truths. And we pray that as we make it our aim to be deliberate in our thankfulness, that it would lead to a greater knowledge of what that thankfulness ought to be like. A greater knowledge of the work that Christ has done on our behalf. A greater realisation of all the different sins and failings and weaknesses that we, that we still have are forgiven, are washed clean. Help us to be thankful for the way you have saved us. And help us to be thankful for our brothers and sisters, for the people that you have joined us to, as you've joined us to Christ. Help us to be thankful that um, we have the body of Christ to build us up, to strengthen us, to support us. And Father, as we are thankful for them, we pray that you would also help us to be a means by which they continue to grow. Help us to be the means to many of the prayers that we might pray for them. For greater faith. For uh, greater sanctification. For a greater opportunity to witness to others. We pray that we would be instrumental in you answering those prayers for our brothers and sisters. And we pray that our unity together, as we love one another, and as we are thankful for one another, and as we live in peace with one another, we pray that that unity might continue to be a witness to the world that you are the true God, that Jesus Christ is our saviour, that he has the power to redeem and to change lives and that he is coming again one day. So Father, we commit our lives to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.